one of the most commonly asked questions that uh, we get in our uh, in our message boxes is know. what program to start with. Yeah, yeah. W- like which which program should I start with? Now, for most people, Take the vast majority of people, beginning. we recommend Maps uh, Anabolic. It's the foundational program, and we recommend it because it brings you. It starts you off with full body type splits. It, it introduces you to the frequency concept of trigger sessions. With MAPS Prime, though. With MAPS Prime, because Prime helps correct imbalances and helps you prime your workout. So it just makes it that much more effective. Now, for the few times I do get messages from like competitors, like bodybuilders and, and bikini competitors and stuff who are stage presentation athletes who have lots of experience, great recovery ability, I'll recommend that they do MAPS Aesthetic. Um, and there are times where I met, recommend people start in mass performance, and this is usually people who are athletic minded or who are you know performance minded. Like, hey, you know, I actually just had a message the other day for someone who's going to go take a test for a police department. So he's like, which program should I do? I have right. you know three week, three months to get ready. Definitely mass performance. It's like the most performance oriented maps program we have. But really, for most people, the ideal sequence is to start with maps anabolic which is uh, you're going to get a lot of strength at a MAPS anabolic and general muscle mass, general speed up your metabolism, like overall building comes from MAPS anabolic. Then you go to MAPS performance, which is how we progress you. And MAPS performance is multiplanar movements. You're doing more complex exercises. You're doing mobility sessions. So you're working on control in these new ranges of motion. So you're basically becoming... Uh, more, and I hate to use the term functional because that's been yeah. sold now so improperly lately, but you do, you become a lot more functional um, with a lot more stamina, um, strength, endurance, power, all the things that an athlete would value. So you go to that. And then lastly, we tend to tell people to move to MAPS Aesthetic, which probably has the most volume, wouldn't you say? Oh, it absolutely does. Each one of those programs, though, um, everybody will benefit from. So we don't think that there's a program. And same thing for like, this is male and female. I get a lot of times too, I get a lot of women that go, what's the program for me? Or I'm a woman, like what do you guys do for women? And Same and, thing. Yeah, yeah, we absolutely refuse to market there's directly. There's no discrimination here. Yes, you're, yeah. you're, you're, the weights do not know the difference of your sex. It doesn't work that way. You're, you're, the weights do, don't know if it's a male or a female lifting it. it. It responds to the movement and it builds muscle or it burns fat. It's that simple. That's it. And we just refuse to market to you know, men and women separately. We'd sell a lot more programs that way if we did the whole thing and we did pink ones and blue now, ones. Now and- that you're bringing this up, if you feel like you have metabolic damage or you feel like your metabolism is a little slow, um, either because you've been dieting a lot uh, on your own or if you've because you've come off of a competition and your metabolism is slow, definitely start MAPS Anabolic. That one gives your body time to recover and really builds up the metabolic system so that you burn more calories. That's the one I start everybody on me- who's got metabolic damage on. So all three of those programs, you can get them individually or you can do a bundle which discounts them almost like 20-something like or 30% off. And that's our RGB bundle, which includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Now, if you want to take it a step further, you can get those three plus include MAPS Prime, which we talked about, or and MAPS Anywhere, which is our, our equipment-free MAPS program. That's our MAPS Super Bundle, and that discounts all of them even further. So those are the two bundles, discounts everything. If you follow them in order, you'll have at least nine months all planned out for you. At least uh, with the Super Bundle, you'll have more like... 10 to 12 months of exercise programming. And this month, enroll in one of those two, and you could, you, your pick, two T-shirts that we have available for an additional less than a dollar, and you'll get those two shirts. That's the promo going on this month. You can find all those programs and read more about them at mindpumpmedia.com. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts. Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. I mean, we've talked about this before. I think we all agree. Like, if they had a CrossFit sport mm-hmm. and CrossFit fitness, yeah, and there were two, you could do camps. it in the same facility. You would just have different classes. Well, if I owned, if I owned a CrossFit box 
uh, I would definitely do that. I would definitely say, like here's now your, it's sport time. Here's yeah. your CrossFit sport uh, classes, mm-hmm. and then here's your CrossFit fitness classes. You know, yeah. are you here because you're interested in competing, yeah. or because you want to train like a competitor, or are you here because you're lo- just looking to get in better shape? Right. And it would have two different. It would be really hard to do it under one facility, though. You, it just, would be because yeah, you'd be right. It would be tough to. You'd almost have to be like it's separate. That's why it's. I don't even know how that looks right now because. We, the, should, we should think about well, it, though, because we'll dude. be talking to Rob well, Wolfs and all these guys. I've thought you know? about this a lot because I've thought about how Orange Theory is made. Like, because Orange Theory is a similar problem, right? Similar issues. They just took out the Olympic lift, so they just went back. They scaled it back, right? So they took the – but you still have the same issues. People over usage, so mm-hmm. you're getting all these, like – It's all intensity focused. Yeah, it's all intensity driven, so you get all these, like, aches and pains on people, and they don't know how to address it. They don't know how to get to the bottom of it. And as in a group class, I would try and teach, like, mobility <laughs> drills and, like, okay, if you – this bothers you here's some moves that you should start to incorporate before you work out so i did my best to like but when you're in a group setting it's so challenging to talk to all 30 to 50 people in there when they're all dealing with different stuff Uh, well you know know, to be totally objective because i have my own you know there's there's emotion behind it uh because i i saw how it was early on and what the attitude was early on yeah and now seeing how it looks like it seems to be shifting to be totally objective, uh, you know, there are some negatives to group training. There's some positives also. Uh, I think because the owners of boxes have so much latitude, because they do, they have, it's not a franchise, it's like an affiliation. They have an incredible amount of flexibility in terms of how they can teach and, you know, coach the classes and all that stuff. I think, like Mike, when we talked to Mike Bledsoe, he was saying the good ones are going to rise to the top and the bad ones are going to sink. And I think when you have a good instructor, we know a couple of them, right? We know a couple of good instructors yeah. that they'll place that kind of emphasis on how they teach it. And this is what I would like to reach out. If we have any CrossFit uh, box owners, I would say, you know, really look at your model and how you can make it as sustainable as possible and make it, uh, you know, in a fashion, in a way to where people can progress from your average sedentary person through the process to being able to incorporate some of these lifts, like right. these Olympic lifts well, and the this sport is at the pinnacle of like, you know, going through the process of, of building your way up towards that. It is. And look, if you go, I trained in, in jujitsu for a while and I went to MMA gyms a couple times and I'll train at them and you had MMA classes. Like these are classes for people who are looking to compete in MMA. And then here's the instructional classes for people who just want to learn jujitsu and boxing. And, mm-hmm. you know, you could box and just hit mitts and bags, or you can box to do smokers. Well, I are- actually think what we're built, what we're currently building could complement uh, yeah. what they're doing. For example, okay, so, and I brought this <clears> up <throat> in the podcast with the girls was, you know, it's very challenging for us because when you think about it, we're, we're teaching a group class. Yeah. We have, I mean, we have a million people out there, okay, listening to listening to Mind Pump that need help and advice and training, and we're giving all of them similar advice, right? So we, in a sense, we're tr- we're teaching a group class, and so the biggest challenge that we've had is like, okay, well, how do we individualize that for all these hundreds of thousands of people, right? Mm-hmm. So what we're having to structure between the all the podcasts, the thirty days of coaching, the YouTube channels, all the playlists, we're starting and all the program all the different programs like Prime, like we're starting to put all these pieces in place that when somebody who's going through goes, Oh, I, this is a problem or, Oh, this is bothering me that they have a direction to go. And I feel like you could take that and you could implement that into a CrossFit class. So when someone's going through a CrossFit class and they're like, Oh, this bothers me. They can't stop the class and and be like, Oh, individualize train this one person, but we'll have the virtual tools that they could say, Hey, go here. You know, mind pumps, a trusted source. We know the guys that are given information are given really good information. If this is bothering you, you notice you can't do this movement, go follow these steps and that we have provided those steps. So I can, I can see us really complimenting yeah, like a, a or you go through those phases, like um, you know, strength, and then you go into like uh, if Olympic lifts is a skill, like you know that you're trying to compete in at one point. Like there's a, a specific protocol where um, you're doing that for like your four month or your your, your four week period, and we're just sharpening the skill. We come back, we do the strength, we do the mobility, we do that kind of work. We come back up, so. There's there's a process that leads up to the actual part where it's like okay I've I've fashioned and sharpened my skill to to a level where I feel like I can now kind of compete in this, um, but like 
it, I feel like it's all there. Like it's all there. Like if you just separate it out and you work on all those different attributes, um, and then you you treat it like now it's it's season. Now I'm in season. You know, yeah. in the CrossFit season, and and what how long that season looks is is I don't know. And, and you know who's who trains or coach people like that? Some of the leaders like. Mm-hmm. We've and here's here's what's changed my mind. And what I mean by changed my mind is my perception has changed pretty pretty uh, significantly in, in in this in regards to CrossFit. And a lot of it has to do with that we've met a lot of these leaders in CrossFit, like Rob Wolf, uh, you know Mike Bledsoe, and some others that we've talked to, and they are fully aware of the pitfalls and they're leading the charge in terms of. Trying how to, to try to fix it? How to fix it and structure it in a way to where it has got longevity and they're very smart. They they understand training yeah. on a level that is you know it's way up there. You know I think you know uh, Bledsoe was talking about how Olymp- how long you know he trained in Olympic lifting before even you know putting it into the fatigue based type circuits that they do and all that stuff. So I see uh, I see a lot of potential progress happening just from the fact that we've talked to these people. Um, and, uh, the only thing that I, uh, I caution is that it's all under the name of CrossFit. And unfortunately, if you have enough bad apples or bad coaches or, you know, people who right. kind of celebrate intensity, it's, it's, too the much, name's tarnished a bit, you yeah. start to tarnish the name yeah. and they're the ones that get all the, well, know, that's the where you got to ask yourself, can they come back from that? You know, can you come back? Has is it gone too far? Mm-hmm. And is the number of bad boxes and bad coaches outweighing how many of the really good ones there are out there? And can it can it get its reputation back? Can well, you get control? Here's of the it? real here's the question behind <clears throat> that, even. Let's take it a step further. I know we talk about business all the time, but you have CrossFit the brand, which is flourishing, right? They've got CrossFit games, which is growing every yeah, it's year. It's still growing. They've got brands behind them and sponsorships that are massive. And then there's the side of the CrossFit clubs, the CrossFit boxes. Are they doing great? Are a lot of them making money, or are a lot of them struggling, or a lot of them well, I think most, opening up and then realizing? I think a this lot is of a lot harder. A lot of them are yeah. struggling, and I think that that was where what we were it was really neat talking to Mike Bledsoe about. And yeah, because Bar- he's trying barbell, to solve that. Yeah, Barbell Shrugged is uh, is going to do very very well in the next five to ten years plus. Um, mm-hmm. Working help, with them, yeah, working with boxes and and organizing that piece because. It's not that easy. Everybody thinks it's like it reminds me of when I started all my boot camp business and I started running them all over the bay and then hiring trainers underneath me to take it. Like in your head, it sounds like a great idea. Like oh, these classes and then they'll charge a <laughs> monthly fee and I'll make a ton of money. And then when I'm so overwhelmed with classes, I can bring a trainer underneath me and then they'll start to manage that and then I'll make a cut of that. Like you know, it was a monster and you know I it, I got it running to where I was making good money, but. It was a lot of work just to make good money. It wasn't like yeah. it wasn't the type of money that I wanted to make and what well, I. We still have a big overhead. I mean, just yeah. having a facility to maintain and. Uh, well, and- I think a lot of people, just like with any fitness trend, right? Any fitness fad that or whatever trend you want to call it, uh, you get a lot of people going in because they see the the dollar signs. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. You're not gonna. Most people don't make a ton of money owning a CrossFit box. You just don't. Owning a gym, you don't make a ton of money. Very few people make a lot of money mm-hmm. owning brick and mortar fitness facilities. And there's not a lot of people making a ton of money with CrossFit. There's a lot of people who are breaking even and losing money. And if you're going into it because you're motivated simply by the money, it's probably not a good idea. If no. you're motivated by and you're passionate about it, and you're a student of the game, and you're really a fitness person. And you have some business sense. Now you've got a decent mix, mm-hmm. but you can't have one and not the other. Like you can't be a super good trainer and know shit about business, and you can't be a super business oriented person and, and have no p- passion about fitness. Either one of those scenarios, you're probably not going to do well. Yeah, you had a lot of those with like. Remember when Curves opened? All these people like, oh, I'm I'm going to open a Curves. It's so easy. It's like, and they all failed. Half of yeah. them failed. Yeah. Well, there was a there was a time when you probably could and you could just ride the wave. But I, but I think that time is over. It just reminds me. It reminds me of the like cannabis club industry. Like when I got into it. You know, in San Jose, I was the first two of the first four that existed. And, you know, now there's like 150. I think it got all the way up to like two, 300, and they started scaling them back. You know, got to a point where everybody was like, oh, my God, all you have to do is open a shop and get going and make all this money. And it wasn't like that. Sure, at the very beginning, it Those was. Those were the good old days, yeah. right? Yeah, it was the good old days. And, and that's why I always tell people it's part of the reason why I'm out. It's not the only reason why I'm out of it. But, you know, it's it's totally different now than what it was when it first started and it was a lot easier you didn't have to uh, know exactly what you're doing and you could still be successful and I'm sure the first 
you know, thousand CrossFit boxes were probably pretty successful just by opening their doors because of the fab. But now momentum. Yeah. yeah. And now, but now it's competitive. And like what Mike was saying, what you're yeah, going to see said is, the era of the like just dirty, dingy, unorganized box is yeah, over. It's over. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Now it's going to be the guys that ri- the ones that rise to the top are going to be those guys that actually and girls that yeah. run these boxes. Uh, you have a lot more business sense behind them and understand, like you said, like you can't just have great business sense. You also need to understand biomechanics and be able to help people. And mm-hmm. you need to be co- already trying to think of you. If you're yeah, a more teach, effective coach, you, know, yeah. you need, if you're going to teach the lifts that they ch- teach in, in CrossFit, you don't need to be just a good trainer. You need to be a fucking yeah. excellent trainer or be smart enough to hire. Yeah. You like, hire specialists. Look, I, I consider myself a pretty good trainer. I would not coach. Olympic lifts, uh, the Olympic lifts that they use in CrossFit. But I'm yeah. smart enough to know that I would have someone do who you, does that. Do you know, you know that, what I mean? I would bring a coach in who's Do you just know that. a big yeah. d- big miss, though, that I think people don't understand when we talk about coaching and, and like, because I know, and I remember talking to one of our buddies who used to coach uh, classes, and he's like, oh, I'm a really good coach. You know, I can get, you know, 10 people you know, at the same time, like, to, you know, pick up on the snatch with me and do this and that. And where I have an issue with it is, like, and this I know this from firsthand. I remember training clients is you can you can stand right next to a client and show them like perfect form of a squat, you know, a thousand times over. And if they're disconnected, right, mm-hmm. they don't have if they're not if the right the correct muscles, they have not trained to fire properly. I don't care how great they of a can't co- replicate it. They can't. They yeah. can't replicate because they're they until you address those issues. And so it's not as it's not a matter of being a great coach with great cues yeah, and great, great form cues. to sh- yeah. to show you. It's like, you know, and that's what I meant the other day when I was talking to the girls on the podcast. I was like, you know, why? What I have the bone I have to pick with it, this is I've spent years, and I mean five plus years, teaching a client a single you know Olympic movement, and that that's taken me years because of the mechanics of it. Like, and I don't, and I'm hesitant to do it because I can barely do it. Break yeah. it because everything can, has to fire optimally. It's yeah. it's such a um, accelerated like like this. That it's such a specific skill to be able to get your entire kinetic chain to do what you want when you want it, like on command, like at and to produce like as much force that is required to to throw this weight around mm-hmm. it's like yeah. it's such a um i just feel like it gets uh, it doesn't get enough respect yeah. you know and, and i feel it's being disrespected by just throwing it in the mix um so yeah so i mean that's it's just one of those things like like you said you got to go to the root of it and like and there's some well then you've got smart people who see an opportunity Right. Well, who yeah. look at it and go, oh shit! I know how I can organize. Well, this Well, that in a was way. that like, was they're into yeah. it, so let's sharpen this up. That right? was Bledsoe. I mean, that was what kind of uh, surprised me when before we got on air with him. We were talking. We were just kind of bringing that up, and he talked about how he did Olympic lifting before he ever even got into CrossFit. And then all of us right away were like, oh really? Yeah. So how do you feel about it? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. did you see what was going on? Because <laughs> normally, yeah. if you know, you meet a power lifter, Olympic lifter, or even a gymnast that that's their sole sport that they do, and then their feelings on CrossFit, they normally are super anti it because it's they, to them they, they feel see like, the form well problem. yeah and to them it's almost disrespectful it's like you're gonna throw you're gonna throw a sport that i've trained for years on how to do you're just gonna throw it in the mix of all these other sports and combine it all together and no and like they normally don't like that so i was really surprised to hear him and how he responded to that yeah but i mean you see that he's a very intelligent business guy and he's like the he, like i thought crossfit ain't going away no you know he's like this ain't going away and i can either sit here and sit on one side talk shit about it all day long or, or can i can influence in, it i can insert myself yeah. trying to influence it in the right direction whether i pass or fail it and make a shit ton of money on the way there and so there's where i have a lot of respect for uh, what he's doing because he does. He sees a problem and he knows that it's not going to go away. And yeah. instead of just sitting sitting behind uh, behind doors and just talking shit about it, he's going to go out there and he's going to try and do something to improve the sport. And this seems like there's more people doing that. Yeah. So I have I have better hopes for the future. So we'll yeah, see I'm slightly being more optimistic now for sure. Like it it, it took a while to. I don't know, like some of the venom to kind of go away. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just. Well, you know, what I this- was in that camp where I just felt like, like I, I felt like because I've worked on a lot of these Olympic lists, I just felt like it was so, it was like nails on a chalkboard. You know. Well, this reminds me, real similar to what we just recently got into with 
uh, the supplements and the protein shake that the doctor doctor recommended. And we got in this huge, you know, 400 comments on fucking Instagram thing that Sal and this doctor were going back and forth with recommending supplements. We had some people get really upset at us. And it's like, it's not that we're saying that no, none of us have used a whey. Pro- I just had a whey protein shake just like fucking three days ago. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, I utilize it still. What we're trying to change is the culture behind it, that mm-hmm. it's being recommended as, as a, as a tool for people. It's like, just like I think about like CrossFit, there's people that should be recommended to that. And there's people that shouldn't be recommended and recommending to the masses is what I have the problem with. And that's where mind pump comes out and speaks, speaks out on it. And we have to kind of come that way because it may seem trivial, but it's, it's one of those things. Like we, we have to sort of put our stance, um, and challenge. Like if, if there's something like that out there that, um, we know there's a better message that, that you could insert in that situation. And, you know, like just, not so much like we hate what you're saying. It's like I know I know where you're coming from with that. Right. But like there's such a better message. Check yourself on that. Yeah. You know, like understand that. Um. You know, well, why are these guys? And and, and that was the, the a lot of the comments I read was like, well, I don't understand where all the hate is coming from. I'm just trying to help people. And you know, and I get that, but like, like we've evolved. Like information has evolved. Like really, the check is to go back and study and, and go go look at. Um, you know, what, where this message came from and what we can do to change, you know, and, and improve on this. Well, I think uh, at, for two things. First off, the, the doc in question, for the most part, uh, if, you, if you know, I went through his social media, 90 something percent of what he says is really good. He's right. got a great message. Uh, you know, he's an obesity specialist. I actually like the guy. We've actually talked to him in the past. It was just, it was the whole slim fast based you know meme you know eat a sensible deep meal and then replace this other meal with a a a shake and then eat another sensible meal and then they compared that to a really bad diet and they're like this is a a great way to lose weight and it's it remind first off it's it's that's the whole slim fast model but it reminds me of like when you hear people say oh god i switched to this diet and i'm so much better it's the best diet in the world it's like well it's it's better than what you had because what yeah. you had was horrible um, but it's not great right and you know the thing with the thing with supplements like baby step yeah, yeah the, the thing with supplements is at most uh, they can be used uh, to you know cover a base that you're missing in your diet and they have convenience and all that stuff but they should never be used to replace real food they should never be marketed that way right uh and the way that they're marketed um is that they are the answer to a lot of your problems like this is how you lose weight you take this and this is how you gain weight you take this and you know our episode on pre-workout supplements that we kind of broke them down it was really popular a lot of people sent us messages and were like i don't realize how much of a waste of money these pre-workout supplements are well some of our own guys that were really intelligent guys um you know that loved if any chance they can find to challenge us <laughs> Love, love to speak out and challenge, which I appreciate. Yeah, yeah we love that. Yeah, it, it creates great dialogue, and I th- and I think that was really the message. So here's a couple of things. One, you, you're never going to see Mind Pump go on some young kid's page and punk him for doing a post like that. Like we're not in the business of bullying people whatsoever. But if there's a doctor who puts out something like that that we think is bad information. We're going to challenge it and mainly so people can see the dialogue that happens because I know he's not going to just get like, oh, you're stupid and get in a name call well, and not to be afraid to challenge authority. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like if, if you're in a position like that and you have a doctor title, everybody immediately is afraid to challenge that, you know, to challenge the information of it. Well, and well, the, <laughs> the people that were coming to his defense, OK, were like me, somebody who might take a protein shake throughout the day. Okay, I might include a protein, but let me tell you why I do that. I'm 220 something pounds, and for me to get even close to a one to one ratio of protein with missing, skipping, fasting, so that is already really challenging. So if I just came off a day where maybe I had a, a pretty long fast or I didn't get that much protein the day before, then I have another day and I happen to be in a hurry and I'm low on protein again, I might make that choice to do that. But to market towards people that are overweight or obese, because you're an obesity doctor, on using using something like a protein shake as a tool for fat loss, I disagree with. Because that person is not 
like in this dire need to make sure they get that extra 20 grams of protein. In fact, why wouldn't that Why person, don't they just fast? Why don't they just fast? Right. Why don't they just fast? Yeah, a better option would literally be <laughs> instead of sensible dinner, you know, fast food meals, uh, sensible, excuse me, sensible breakfast, fast food meal, sensible dinner, and then replace the fast food meal with protein, a better option would be sensible breakfast, Skip lunch, yep. Then have a sensible dinner, right? That's actually the that's actually the best option. We know this, right? Right. Or have some nuts, have some fruit. I mean, we can go all day. There's a million things I think that are. That's just it. There's a lot of things better than that shake. And the people that were arguing that, that with us yesterday, you're an exception to the rule. Like, go ahead, you can have a shake. You're not an obese person who's trying to lose weight and being recommended that. You're some guy who's trying to build muscle, and you're concerned that you're not you're not well, going to get enough grams of protein in for the day. Let's talk about protein powders for a second. Let's get let's let's get into them. Let's, let's do like we did the other day with supplements. Let's actually we'll pull, break them down. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Let's right. pull them up. Let's turn the labels look at around. The top ones. Let's yeah. talk. Yeah. Right. Let's talk about the well, top ones out there. Critical eye on First them. off, let's look at the history of powdered food. Powdered food um, has actually been around for quite a while. Um, powdered protein in particular was used as a way to, and I believe formulas were probably the first things that be created, right? When mothers mm-hmm. couldn't produce milk. And so they tried to you know, do Isn't this powder. stuff that we use in the war for like soldiers and stuff like that that we'd send over there so it, they could so they could get the meals while they're on the go? And it, so, I mean, that it where was, it came from? It was it was a uh, it was never considered like a great option to replace. It was a, it was an emergency kind of option. Right. Um, bodybuilders started using protein powders, or at, or I should say, uh, um, advertising protein powders when it became common knowledge that protein built muscle. So if you're in the sport of muscle building and protein builds muscle, it's an easy sell, right? I can sell the public and say, hey, protein builds muscle, take this powder, get this extra protein, therefore you're going to build extra muscle. We know that's false. We know that past a certain point, it doesn't matter how much protein you eat. And that number uh, is backed by pretty conclusive science, lots and lots of studies that show that about 0.6 to 0.8 grams per pound of body weight, and this is for lean individuals, is the upper limit, meaning any more than that is probably uh, you're you're just wasting protein or or, or at least it's getting turned into energy or stored as body fat. So if you're a 200 pound athlete, you know you're looking at 150, 160 grams. Anything over that, it's not really doing you any benefit. So there's no need to really seek out extra protein and to try and get extra protein. But what's really interesting is somewhere along uh, somewhere along the lines uh, or somewhere along the way, protein powders became touted as health food, which is yeah. really weird. Right. It's really, really weird because if you really break it down, and I want the audience to kind of just be objective for a second. Let's break this down, right? When we think of health, true health and true wellness, from a nutritional standpoint, that means whole, natural, varied food. Fruit, vegetables, nuts, healthy meats. For some people, that means dairy, good fats, good proteins, good carbohydrates, right? Nowhere in that is something that comes out of uh, a box or something that's heavily engineered or processed. Right. But for some strange reason, uh, and this was due to the brilliant marketing behind it, uh, protein powders turned into a health food. Like if you went to a health food store, you'd walk through and then they had protein powder, well, this, which this, is very strange. This goes back to the knowing that protein and fat are essential, right? We know that th- those two are essential. So if they're essential, I can scare you. I can scare you that you're not getting enough of it. You could die. You're not he- hitting your RDA. Yes, you could die. You're not getting your RDA. Muscle could fall off your body. And for somebody who's deciding to exercise and lift weights, oh, and then also for recovery reasons, right? So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch the, the amino acid side of it. So here's where I think... We, we took a little bit of good information and we exaggerated the fuck out of it and we built a market around it. And now we just, because so many people are making so much money on it, it's got, it was, how many times did we almost align ourselves with the whey protein? Mm-hmm. How many times? How many times did we go back and forth and say, hey, listen, I At still least 20. I still yeah. use them. I mean, I tell you guys all the time, like I still find it for me, okay, for my size. I was just telling Justin the other yeah. day because I've been intuitive eating for quite some time now. And then just recently I started tracking again and kind of keeping track of my protein. And I grossly under eat protein. I, I, my whole life, I was a sugar eater, carb eater. So I naturally gravitate towards carbohydrates. And when I intuitively eat, 
I still kind of gravitate that direction. And when I start to actually break it down, a big guy at 200 and something pounds like I am could actually have a day where I only got 90 grams of protein, which is really low for someone like me who's lifting as much weights as I'm lifting. So for me, if I had a day where I'm like, oh shit, look, that's, a, that's two days in a row of only like 90 to 120 grams of protein, I'm going to have a shake before I go to bed. So I get that extra protein inside there. So I get it. I understand where it could have its place. Now I would be better off having a fucking full meal. Which is why you you even just said like, oh, I just had one three days ago. Right. People consume protein powders several times every single day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the people I've worked with will have a minimum of one, but usually two shakes every single day. You probably will have less than two shakes a week. Oh yeah, no, it's it, my tub. I don't even know how long I've had that tub. I've had that tub for a long time, so it lasts lasts for quite some time. Right, so. right. And so, and if you now, I understand if you fall for the whole, you need to eat one and a half to two grams of protein per pound of body weight, which is complete one hundred percent utter bullshit. But I understand if you fall for that, that protein powders then become essential, because if I'm a two hundred pound guy. And I'm led to believe that I need to have 400 grams of protein, but I have to also be yeah. within a certain amount of calories. Where am I going to find all that pure protein without any fat or carbohydrates? And how can you digest Powder. all of that, you know, without something that's as easily like processed as as a protein powder? Right? I mean, eat 400 grams of protein from real food. Good luck. Oh my god. I'm, yeah, and so now powders become essential. Right. And uh, that's so the what other you place so they hit so you. number one realize that that is not doing you any good it's a it's a it's a waste of time to take that much protein on a daily basis it just absolutely is it doesn't help you at all maybe for extreme athletes with lots of muscle in for very short periods of time there may be a little bit of a benefit i even debate that but definitely no no benefit on a regular basis zero so at the most one gram of protein per pound of body weight is right where you want to be at and if you're not lean then you can cut that way down. I mean, if you're walking around and you're a dude and you're at 20% body fat, don't match your body weight to your protein intake because a lot of that's fat. Yeah. It's probably even a lot less. Number two, realize that protein powders are about the most processed you can get when it comes to processed food. Right. Th think of the process that goes through making food, taking real food. I mean, they sell fucking beef protein. What is that? That carnivore protein? You ever seen that? Mm -mm. Made from beef protein. Oh, no. Think about the process that they go through to take steak or red meat, <laughs> extract the protein, Grind separate, the, the, out of it. separate yeah. the fat out of it, right? Because they want just protein. Oh, right, yeah. You can't have the fat. Dry it and turn it into a powder that you can mix in water. And then flavor it so it doesn't taste <laughs> like a steak. That's palatable. <laughs> it tastes like cookies and cream instead. Yeah. Mm. That's palatable, right? That you'll actually drink. Think about that. The yeah. amount of engineering that goes into that. We are talking about the highest level of engineering to create an extremely processed food. So protein powders are very, 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 very processed. So if you're a health, if you're a person with health uh, as your priority and wellness, understand that on a daily basis you are consuming something that's extremely right. processed and engineered uh, to be very, very. What's that uh, power? What's that powerlifter's name? And he's like four hundred pounds. He's like one. He has one of the squat records. I was watching his Instagram. This fucker, like every day, takes like literally. He'll take eight ounces of steak, six ounces of chicken. He'll take two avocados and, and a, blend it and blend that fucker and oh just and God. drink like. Well, think about it. You're like four. You're like four hundred pounds. Like, yeah. I think he's three high three hundred. Got to get it in and like, power lifting all necessary. the time. So just, I also want people to consider your the digest uh, digestive issues that are caused oh by. My God. You know, it's, uh, and if you're listening right now, don't you fucking lie to me. You know your farts smell horrible oh my, uh, when you take protein powder. Your stomach is very loud. It is a, uh, wow. it's like a common, it's so common that if you go into a gym or you talk to bodybuilders, you talk about protein farts, everybody understands. Oh, Lord. Everybody knows. And it's related to, more often than not, the protein powder, not the necessarily yeah. the food. Well, all you got to do is find your protein shaker. Like a couple of days later, like oh, you left fuck. in your car. Oh, Just horrible. open that up and take a big whiff. Yeah. That's what's going on inside you. So think of what's happening to your digestion that's causing that 
you know, <laughs> to that bubble guts and the farts and all that stuff. A lot of people get constipation or diarrhea. Which should already be powders. like a sign or a red flag for you that you're probably overdoing it a bit. Like, come on, like you're, if if your stomach it's feel, not benefiting, yeah. You. If you're if you're if you're shitting like diarrhea, okay, and you're and you're farting like crazy, your stomach's all bubbly. Like you're probably overdoing the protein. I think your body's telling you something. Right? Not only yeah. are you overdoing it, but if your digestive system is off, if your gut is off. You're actually uh, you're actually limiting or or uh, you know uh, l- limiting or uh, restricting your body's ability even to burn body fat and build muscle. Without a healthy gut, lots of systems uh, are in jeopardy, and part of them is your ability to burn body fat and build muscle. Think about it when your stomach's messed up. How strong are you? How fit do you feel? How healthy do you feel? Think of the fact you know understand the fact that many key neurotransmitters are created in the gut. That hormone uh, hormones change if your gut is off. Uh, that sleep is altered. Nutrient absorption is off. So if your gut is off because you're taking a protein powder, but you're telling yourself, oh, but this is building muscle, so it's helping me, so it's worth it. It's actually not only not building muscle for you, it's probably taking that away from you. Right. So if you have those problems also... You're you're not doing yourself any favors by taking these protein powders. Well, it doesn't and, help. It doesn't help too. When, like we were saying, this thing's been around for a long time, so we found all kinds of ways to market it too. Like when, now, where we have like a nighttime one, we have the anabolic window is so popular. So you know, hey, you got that thirty minute window to maximize your muscle building. So you got you know, it's much easier just to drink a shake real quick than go home and like make a meal that could take an hour. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have an hour. I only got 20, 30 minutes to hit this anabolic window. I got to take this shake, dude. Yeah, it's absolute. Uh, it's false. Um, does it uh, accelerate glycogen, um, uh, you know, repletion? It does, but it doesn't mean it's not. It's not going to happen if you don't have that shake. Uh, really, where the benefit comes from is if you plan on having another workout a couple hours later. That's real hard. Then you'll benefit from having something post workout. But it's not limited to a shake. The same thing happens with food. You can literally have a chicken breast or some tuna and some white rice. Or studies have actually shown a fucking glass of milk right. is just as effective. Yeah, right. Literally, a glass of milk, it's got a little bit of the sugars from the lactose, it's got the proteins, it's got some of the fats. I did a post on that a long time yeah. ago. You drink it, yeah. and they've compared it to protein shakes, and it's just as effective uh, on all those on all those levels, the whole the difference is it's not as expensive. Well, let's flip. Let's flip. Yeah. Let's take the number one, which I see Doug's got it's up on the TV. Pure. Doug's got. Looks so like he went on to bodybuilding.com and he's looking nutrition. up the top uh, ten uh, protein powders, and the number one protein powder is by Optimum Nutrition. It's gold standard, one hundred percent whey. Doug, why don't you click on that view product and let's break it down. So um, let's look at their ingredients. Uh, first off, um, a protein blend, which comes from whey protein isolate, uh, concentrate, and peptides. Basically, it's just whey protein. Isolate, uh, they call the purest form, right? Because they've completely removed everything else aside from the protein. Sucrose. Uh, concentrate. Uh, oh, and, red number 42. Wow. Yeah, there you go. Boy, they got them both. So here's the rest of the ingredients. Yeah. Uh, lecithin, uh, natural and artificial flavors, citric acid, sucralose. Uh, F, D, and C, red number 40. And then there's something called aminogen. If you have a protein oh, it has powder- so, It has soy also. What's lactase? Is that another sugar? Uh, no, what, what, these Katrina are all- Katrina and I were looking to grow a lactase and a red 40, <laughs> 40 tree <laughs> yeah, next, right. next summer. We said, Beautiful. No, we've, no noted, we've, noted, we've noticed how many of these are in supplements. We thought we could probably grow one of those. No, lac- start lactase is the it. enzyme that breaks down lactose. So, What's a red 40 tree? So it helps people digest it. What's a red 40 tree look like? Uh, exactly. Hmm. Um, what you'll find in protein powders is most of the things in the ingredient, th- uh, underneath ingredients, are there to increase palatability or make the make it taste and feel better. So they try to add things that make it feel smoother to your mouth and they add things that make it dissolve really well in a shaker cup. If you look at all of the money that goes into protein powders, all the, the money that goes into research and development, the vast majority of it goes into uh, palatability. It's not going into creating this crazy 
effective protein powder that's going to be better for you. Now, it says it also has soy in it, but it's promoting this as whey protein specifically. Uh, it just has le- uh, lecithin in there, which is uh, almost like, a, like a uh, an additive. That keep, yeah, it's an additive to keep it. I think it keeps it from clumping. I see. So they have to put that in there because if someone's allergic uh-huh. uh, to soy, that they'll know that there's trace amounts of soy in there. But it's not soy protein that they're putting in Got there. It. So zero, you're not getting you're not getting iron, calcium, you're not going to get vitamin A, C, you're not getting any, D, you're not getting really a lot, any uh, vitamins in here. We're getting mostly just a little bit of sugar and- No, a, gla- for- a, a glass of milk is better for you. If you can have whey, then just have a glass of fucking milk um, and you're good and it's cheaper um, and it's better for you. Uh, you know, as, as far as- The uh, difference is 10. That's It's a difference of 14 more grams of protein. Yeah. And here's the other thing. Like if you're reading, if you're looking at this, if you're looking at your protein powder and there's like an amino acid blend that they add in there, a red flag needs to go up. Number one, if you're getting 20 <laughs> grams of protein, you have all the branching amino acids you need. Adding extra extra BCAAs or glutamine or whatever isn't going to do you any, any good. Studies have, have shown this. If you have enough protein- you Whoa, don't that need guy's shredded. You don't need that. But if you do look at your protein powder and uh, in the ingredients, they do have, you know, a bunch of added amino acids. Here's why that's a red flag. Recently, it's been uh, discovered that protein powder companies were spiking their protein powders with amino acids to fool tests into believing it had more protein than it did. Because the way that they'll test protein powders is they'll look at uh, particular amino acids and then based off that they'll say, okay, this has 30 grams of protein. Well, if you're a company, you know that you can add those amino acids for cheaper than just adding extra protein. You could protein. probably Google protein spiking and what Sal is talking about will, would pop up. That's just my guess because yeah. it was popular. It's pop. It's been popular for a long time. Well, a I, lot of protein powders were found to do this. It wasn't. It wasn't like one or two. No, I remember we I, we talked when we first started this podcast. There was a big study that had came oh, out. I remember that. Uh, in, in regards, we had just talked about supplements, and then out comes this study that picked the top like six or seven protein shakes and all of them were less than 50% of what they said they had in it and there was only one that was actually 50% of what they said so all of them were grossly over reporting uh the protein and they were doing it through this protein spiking mm-hmm. which is what Sal was talking about where mm-hmm. you throw all these amino acids in there yep. so the test shows that oh all because of all the amino acids added in there plus the protein oh this must have 30 must grams have of all this protein yeah it must yeah. have 30 grams or 40 grams no of protein. and it's like 15 or something like that and here's what you got to be careful of by the way if you google what adam said because doug just googled it you'll pull up a bunch of blogs that are going to tell you about protein spiking that are also selling their own protein <laughs> it's a very very, very oh, smart oh yes it's a very smart strategy so if, the I, internet. if i'm a supplement company and a new as news story comes out that uh, you know fda or independent lab went out and tested all these yeah. you know creatines and found that they all had you know toxic no uh, news is bad news, byproducts right? then if i'm a creatine manufacturer what i'm going to do is i'm going to write an article that's going to talk about that but then at the bottom of it or whatever i'll link you to the creatine that i sell that seems to be good so that's optimum nutrition oh jim oh, here we go hey, our favorite, our favorite guy coming dude, up in the top dude yeah. jim is fucking killing shit, it shit up bro. i think he's up there because he is bossing out bodybuilding.com yeah. don't they own that company wasn't there a lawsuit or something yeah he's now on gnc i wonder if these else. are i wonder if these these are the ones that they want maybe to sell they're more. trying to get rid of them i yeah. want to know if he's stupid rich from this or not me uh i, I think know. i partnered i think been, i partnered with he the might wrong have been guy. cut out he yeah. might have been cut out of this one <laughs> you partnered with the wrong italian <laughs> yeah right uh, doug why don't you pull that up let's look at the ingredients here the ingredients what you to, got in here jim let's see what you got so chocolate cookie crunch flavor oh <laughs> chocolate cookie Whoa, crunch. Look, at, look, hey, look at the ingredients that list. sounds like my uh, now look kid at that cereal. look at that ingredient oh, okay. list this could take a day just to get through this all right, right here we go protein blend it's got whey protein uh micellar casein milk protein isolate and elg, uh, egg albumin um as the uh, the mix for protein so does it matter if you're drinking a protein powder that is pure whey or that's this huge mix of proteins? Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, we are literally splitting hairs to the point where it's it's not going to make a difference at all. The it, difference, will, it will for marketing purposes. Yeah, exactly. Like, hey, our protein's better because it has, you know, all these- Because uh, it has casein in it's it. It's got all these other uh-huh. proteins that digest yeah. slower and faster and yeah. whatever and- um, it's the perfect blend. No, you're 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 so splitting hairs. It's not going to make a difference. So it's that's stupid. It's stupid. It's just all marketing. The next uh, thing that he has in there as an ingredient is non dairy creamer, 
which is made for from sunflower oil. Uh, let's oh, see. there we go, Doug. Thank you. Uh, sunflower oil, corn syrup solids, sodium cassinate, mono and diglyceride, dipas- uh, di- dipotassium phosphate, tricalcium phosphate, soy lecithin, and uh, tocopherols. So he basically threw something in there. I mean, that's what I bought at the grocery store. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, uh, first of all, uh, the first two things in there, I love how we sunflower say he, like, like it's Jim who's like stirring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jim. Yeah. Hey, you put your name on the bottle. Yeah, buddy. right? That's yeah. what happens so, when you put your name uh, on it. <laughs> so sunflower oil um, and corn syrup solids, two uh, unhealthy uh, ingredients that I would, completely av- uh, I would completely avoid. Sunflower oil is a very inflammatory fat. So it, it's up there with all the other vegetable oils that are highly processed that are uh, fats you should stay away from. I mean, they're up there with, they're not quite as bad, but what they're is, up there what with. What does cocoa powder Dutch process mean? Uh, like, a, like a Dutch oven? My like, favorite like, what's is. A, what's, a, what's a cocoa <laughs> powder Who doesn't Dutch love a, a Dutch oven? Right? A what's, good Dutch oven. What is a cocoa yeah. powder Dutch process? I don't even understand half of it. Well, so, so check uh, this out. Let me blow you guys away. Cookie bits. Chocolate so, cookie bits? I like, I like guar gum. You yeah. know, remember that band Guar? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> dude, I saw them one time live. It was fucking awesome. Club, Halloween, yeah. I highly suggest it. So I'm gonna trip you guys out. So here's a little uh, brilliance in the marketing because they know that people read the ingredient list. So they could have just listed sunflower oil, corn syrup, solids, sodium casein, all those different things. But instead, what they did is they put non dairy creamer, and then in parentheses they put the ingredients to non dairy creamer. Now the reason they did that is. Because we've con- been conditioned now that if we don't understand an ingredient, it's probably not good for us, right? So, but w- so what they're doing now is they're explaining the ingredients. So, oh, it's non-dairy creamer. Now to the average person, like, oh, non-dairy creamer, not a big deal. Non-dairy creamer is extremely processed, invented, engineered creamer, which is the alternate to regular creamer, which comes from dairy. Yeah. And if you're trying to avoid dairy, uh, then you shouldn't be having this protein anyway because it's got whey. Cows are bad. Labs even. are good. Yeah. So, apparently. So. So sunflower oil and corn syrup, I would avoid anyway, but they threw them in there because what it does is it gives it a nice mouth feel. So when you mix it, it tastes creamier. So that's why the non-dairy creamer is in there. Then you've got cocoa powder in there, which I, I think to give it a little bit of a chocolate flavor. Of course, natural and artificial flavors, mostly artificial. Chocolate cookie bits. Again, rather than just putting rice flour, sugar, tapioca starch, uh, cocoa processed with alkali, palm oil, cornstarch, salt, natural flavors, sodium bicarbonate, and soy lecithin. Instead of just putting all that, they put, it's chocolate cookie bits, and then they put all that in there. Uh, of course, this is appealing again to your palate. If you're reading this and you're like, oh, protein powder. Oh, shit, they put chocolate cookie mm, bits. Chocolate cookie but bits. it has barely any carbs. This is crazy. Um, just a bunch of yeah stuff in there to make it taste a certain way. Guar gum, again, mouthfeel. And then a bunch of uh, preservatives and sucralose. Um, this is a chemical shitstorm of a protein powder. So if you were going to buy a protein powder and your, uh, uh, your choices were this and optimum nutrition, uh, based on the ingredients, I would go with optimum. Of course, my advice would be to go with neither and just eat food. Why? They both have that. Uh, because this one has a lot more random shit in there oh, it yeah. probably tastes better well this is also okay so since you said that well, the flavor I, of it probably uh, promotes this is that. something that i if like because i always like you know taylor was talking about this the other day when he had uh, dr ruscio was like you know a lot of the great stuff that you just shared right now just went over a lot of people's head and i think an easy way to tell people like when you read the back to the ingredients if there's a lot of things that you can't sound out yeah. And you don't know what it is, and it's really long. Take caution. That's just a red flag right away. I've never in my life found something that's healthy for me, and the ingredients list is fucking long. It just doesn't. It's not that yeah. they don't. They don't yeah. go hand in hand, right? So if it's a something really healthy for you, normally it's going to have a very very short. I think it was like five ingredients. Somebody told me that a long time. Oh, ago. is that? What, I mean, yeah, and I've always kind of gone off of that. Well, if you're buying whey protein, if you want whey protein powder. You know what should you know what the ingredients should say? Whey. Whey protein. That's yeah. it. Like number I mean, one. Whey. No color, no flavor, just whey. Maybe maybe another First, ingredient to prevent cl- maybe to prevent clumping. Yeah. You know, and that's pretty much it. And just mix that shit in your shaker cup and drink it and stop being a pussy and trying to drink, you know, a freaking milkshake. 
It's like if you want something to taste good, go drink a goddamn milkshake. I don't, I don't, I don't get that. Yeah, separate your, you know, your options there. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, again, <laughs> make it a treat and, del- and delicious. Again, it's got a shit ton of stuff It'll in it. And version, if you're drinking look. this every single day, which by the way, well, again, a while ago I got into a deba- the debate with uh, with Jim Stepani, and because he was telling people to consume an incredible amount of protein, and he was telling people to take four servings a day of mm, this powder. Yeah. Think about that now for a second. <laughs> Half of your protein every single day, a quarter to half of your protein every day comes from this uh, laboratory creation. And you're going to do that long term. Do you really think that's going to be a good idea? Probably not. No, I don't, I, I don't think it's a good idea. And I, I don't think that – I don't think you cannot not have or not have a protein way. I think there's – there it can be something you can utilize. I think the choices that I think we're trying to get to people to understand is that – if you're somebody who is missing your protein intake grossly and you don't have time to get a meal and you're trying to get that in, there is a lot better choices than the cinnamon swirl, chocolate, chocolate bit, <laughs> cookies and cream way. Yeah. If that's your your reason behind doing it, where we got, the I think where we got into this, this whole treat. battle and how this conversation got started was because of this doctor and mind pump going back and forth on recommending it to the masses as a good option in replace of burger and fries. Mm -hmm. And it's like the top of the shit pile. Like it's okay. So what? Yeah, it's a different, it's another option, but it's still not an ideal fucking option for people. And I feel like people in my grandmother used those expressions in in a position like we are in, or he is in as a doctor, we have, a, we have a higher responsibility to educate and inform people. And the one off. So the, 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 the idiots that we're arguing or debating or getting all getting, taking it personal with us, like you, okay, you're a one off bro. You know, you're somebody who, you know, cycles for four hours, lifts weights like crazy. You have a low body fat. You have a hard time getting the protein in. You don't have time to sit down and make your meal. Sure, by all means, go get your your all pure whey protein shake in and, and do that. But when we're talking about people that are, if you're an obese doctor, you're talk your audience are a lot of fat people and a lot of fat people that struggle with their food choices and teaching them to replace that with some artificially sweetened bullshit fucking shake instead of burgers and French fries. It's the top of the shit pile. It's the it's the uh, next least worst thing for them to do, and it's not a tool. Well, like that's everybody's argument is like, oh, he's just helping giving them an option for a tool. To no, it's not a tool. It's not a tool at all. It'd be a tool for the other guys, the exceptions to the rule, the one percenters, the ones that actually might, the athletes, the ones that probably could use it and probably know more about their body. But when you're talking to the general population, like what we do on Mind Pump. That's why we share stuff like this. It's not that we, I don't take a whey shake every once in a while. It's that I know I'm, I'm not like most people. Mm-hmm. I'm, most people are not training seven days a week and weigh and have 200 pounds of lean body mass on them. Most people have about 130 to 150 pounds tops of muscle on their body and they're overweight. And if anything, they can cut out a meal. They don't need to be replacing or they can have some nuts or have some fruit or a million other options besides a shake. Yeah, I want, uh, you know, the other thing too is, uh, we are all we're constantly chasing taste mm-hmm. without mm-hmm. Uh, substance, and what I mean yeah. by that is, I want something that's sweet, but I don't want sugars or carbohydrates, right? And this is uh, this is kind of hacking the or, or or at least hijacking your body's natural systems of uh, of perception. And you want to ask yourself why your body perceives tastes p- to begin with. Like, why do we even taste things? Why is that an important uh, evolutionary trait that humans have. Like, why should I taste things? What What if I just tasted nothing, but I just ate? Mm, you're like, trying to identify whether it has nutrients in it or not that you need. That's what's happening. Like, uh, for again, we evolved to when we sensed uh, the, or we perceived this taste of sweetness, it was accompanied by a fast burning source of energy, uh, some type of a natural sugar or carbohydrate. Um, and it was accompanied by certain nutrients that were found primarily in foods that tasted that way. Like vitamin C, for example. Vitamin C is difficult to find uh, if you, unless you eat you know, good sources of you know, like fruits and, and certain vegetables. And so it makes sense that when you tasted sweet, you, know, you craved it and you ate it. And fruit was kind of hard to find for the most part. You didn't find a lot of it if it grew naturally. And when you did find it, you ate the hell out of it. Um, so... What happens if we seek out taste without, uh, you know, a macronutrient? Well, it, it changes a few things. Number one, it changes 
think about it this way. Your body's now expecting sugar or carbohydrates, but it doesn't get any. It still uh, pretends like it gets it in terms of how the chemicals and the hormones react in the body, but now it's not getting it. So it's kind of being fooled a little bit. Your brain's uh, you know, uh, centers that perceive this particular type of taste start to get altered to the point where the, you, you're now a, a now regular sweet, no longer taste sweet. To where you need these artificial, you know, engineered uh, sweet tastes. So now, when I do go to eat fruit, it tastes bland. Or I go to eat regular food, it tastes doesn't taste satisfying. I need to have this extreme, you know, type of flavor. So this is what you're doing when you're consuming these types of things, which is why, you know, people have such a tough time giving up their well, protein shakes because they love the taste. This is why yeah. we're so passionate about it too. Is that we we know this from. You know, I know this not, be- and I said this on that thread was I know this not from the you know hundreds of people's lives that I've changed. I know this because of the thousands of people I failed because I told clients here have these bars and use this when it, when the next time you're hungry don't eat don't go through McDonald's have this bar instead. Hey, here's some of these shakes. Like make sure you have this shake right after your workout, or if next time you want to go through McDonald's again, have this shake instead. And mm-hmm. I failed them all. I wasn't helping them. I wasn't getting to the root cause. So when I see a post like that, that's where the passion comes from. It's not that nobody should have a whey protein shake. The the people we're talking to are not the people that fully understand and and calculate out their macros and know that they're only getting 60 grams of protein so they need this shake to get an extra th- we're not talking to those people we're talking to the rest of the fucking world which is the majority well like like we said you, you, if you if you're eating adequate protein uh to build muscle it's about 0.6 to 0.8 grams uh per pound of body weight which means you can easily get it from food and it'll fit your calories and do all that stuff um you don't have you to can't, drink it you, okay i want to stop you there though you can if you're you know, especially if you're the average person who's probably got 100 to 150 pounds of lean mass on you. It can be challenging for somebody who's got over 200. I get that. Sure, you sure. Know, I, get, I, I, I get that and I understand that, but I also think- But that, again, even a, even a big guy, you know, like you, you're, you're not doing two shakes every day. No. You, well, Do you see what I'm saying? What like I'm, what I'm like not, they've worked it into their meal plan. Yeah, it becomes, yeah. exactly. It beca- it's, it's their diet. It's an emergency. Like, uh, it's an emergency, and it's something that you- I've actually seen meal plans where you see you see it show up, like meal three, Oh, well, I mean, shake, I, d- I, did, meal I did that. Six, I mean, shake. we did that. I did yeah. that as a trainer for many years. For yeah. many years, I would wreck, which is like how that post was, which was the sensible breakfast, the mm-hmm. shake for lunch, and then the meal for- for dinner, I mean, that was, uh, we were taught that when we were going through training, the whole apex thing. We talked about this the other day on the podcast was, right. you know, when we were taught to sell supplements, we would tell people to eat these shakes and bars and replace of meals and restrict the calories. And we were t- pitching the same bullshit that it, it's a tool. Yeah. It's a tool to help these people lose weight. No, it's not. Not when 80% of them get fat again. We're not fucking helping anybody. Yeah, that's it's like we- how cereal made its way into being a balanced part of your breakfast. Yeah, exactly. Uh, cereal is dog shit. Yeah, and you got to you have to think, uh, you know, how do we define success? Because, you're, because what's going to happen is people will show studies and be like, look, all these, these people, people lost, lost weight. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, if you lost weight, you still haven't succeeded. If you gain it back, you failed. If you lost weight, you're healthy and fit and it's always, it's, that's it. Now that's your new lifestyle and you've lost weight and it never comes back. Now you can call that a success. Very, very I don't know people. where I heard it first, but someone said it great. Where they said, you know, America does not have a weight loss program a problem. We do not. We do not have a weight loss pro- no, we problem. we lose it. We just don't keep yes, it Yes, we lose millions of pounds as a nation yeah. every single year. The problem that we, we have- we put on more. When, when, that's when the problem. Rebounds. The problem yeah. is that nobody keeps it off. And that, that should be everybody, you know, I don't care who you are, but that should throw up a flag for everybody. And I especially yeah. think it should throw up a flag for those doctors and people in professional positions that have been in those positions for a long time or that are speaking to the masses that this message- is not a good message. That's all I'm saying. We're not saying you can't take a protein shake. Mm. We're not saying all. We're not demonizing protein shakes. No, not not that at all. I use them. Okay. It's that what we're trying to do is let people know that it's not a good message for the masses. If you're that anomaly, if you're that one off, if you're that athlete, fucking take it. Mm. You know, use it. Use it judiciously. Understand that it's not ideal. That you should be eating whole foods, but you're in a pinch. You're in a bind. Have your fucking shake every once in a while. Good for you. The rest of the people should not be taught that this is a good replacement. No, you for should. Real food. You shouldn't have. You for the most part, you should not be having a protein shake every single day. I, I I have a protein shake even 
at home. And the way I use it is kind of like the way Adam does. Or every once in a while, I'll make myself a, a smoothie type of treat or whatever. And I use it for flavor or to add a little bit of protein just because I don't feel like I'm not blending chicken breast or, you know, whatever, like other people, you know, like that bodybuilder you were talking about. But it's going to last me a long time. I just don't use it that often. So the number three on this list of the top 10 was Muscle Tech, Nitro Tech, and it's a cinnamon swirl flavor. Let's go ahead and swirl. It's, Ooh, it's, cinnamon swirl. Yeah. Uh, oh, so this one's got all the added. Uh, well, this one. Sounds like it's a Willy Wonka. The Nitro uh, Amino Matrix. Factory. This one has nitro. Uh, this one has amino acids added to it. That to me is always a big red flag. You know, first of all, you don't need to add the uh, the BCAA. So you're paying for Which this is probably how uh, they get it from 20 to 30 grams of protein. People are yeah. excited. One gram of sugar. Wow. Well, ah, yes, I'm doing good. No, they have a huge uh, whey protein blend. I guess that's now become the thing. It's supposed to look a lot, you know, like, oh, oh, it's a blend. Therefore, so it's more get, yeah, superior. So you get them all, right? Artificial sweeteners, uh, more sunflower lecithin gum blend, which is to give it that feeling of uh, smoothness. Um, Enzaplex, which is just uh, papain and amylase, which are enzymes that help break down protein. Of course, sucralose. Uh, I will say this about sucralose, by the way. Sucralose is by far the most popular artificial sweetener you'll find in your protein powder. Sucralose has been demonstrated to alter microbiome or, you know, at least your, your gut flora. So it does alter gut flora. Not a good idea. You don't want to do that every once in a while. Probably not a big deal. If you eat it on a regular basis, you may be harming your gut. Um, and after five to 10 years, you may find that you all of a sudden can no longer digest protein powders. All of a sudden, you've become. Uh, you know, uh, and you intolerant say, to and dairy. And you say may because this is an area that we're still learning about. We are, but you, right. but there, you won't find a single gut health specialist that thinks that sucralose is a good idea on a daily basis. It's just not. Which is um, a, this, and this is just so people that have been listening to the show for, or maybe you haven't. Like, there's whenever we have somebody that is a special, either a nutritionist specialist or somebody that's a gut health specialist, and we bring this question up, that's always the answer mm -hmm. is to, I would be very, very, I would, if you're going to take something like that into your diet, I would definitely minimize the amount of it that you allow in there. Yeah. It's it's in a lot of food out there though. It, it's in a ton of food. It is because again, we're chasing flavor, right? We're chasing that particular, you know, sweet or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I'll tell you what, for the most part, most of the popular protein, first of all, don't you don't need to take a protein powder. That's my advice. But if you want to, if you really, really want to take one, seek out one that is organic, uh, has not flavored. minimal Why flavor? ingredients. No flavor it with some strawberries and blueberries. Yeah, no flavor. But if you want to get a flavored one, then get the ones that are organic and naturally flavored, and they'll probably be flavored with uh, stevia. It's, you know what's crazy yeah. to me is if you take – a lot of people don't realize this – if you take a half a cup of blueberries and three strawberries, you know how little calories that is? Not much. And how much how much flavor that you get from three whole strawberries and a half a cup to a cup of blueberries? The calories are very low. So that's how I would take my shakes. I'd add a banana because I like bananas too. You go and you add that in with some ice and either some almond or coconut milk or water if you want to go really low on calories. And you get a plain ass way. Plain with no flavoring, no nothing. And then you throw it in there. So if that, and then you make your own. And then you could play with things. And you could add it with different types of fruits. And so I'm getting some good natural fruits in there. Some good, some good antioxidants. Some good real whole foods with this plain ass way by itself. So if you're somebody who's seeking that extra gram to 10 to 20 grams of protein, you absolutely feel you need it because you can't seem to find a way to get all the protein through whole foods on a very <laughs> regular basis. Then I get it. You now, know what I'm now, Doug, can you look up because I want to uh, for people who can't have uh, dairy um, or, uh, you know, vegans or whatever. Vegans might be a good – they might be a category of people that would do well uh, with a protein powder just because it's hard to get uh, adequate protein with a vegan diet. No, yeah. look up look up Warrior Blend. Yeah. Click on that and let's look at the ingredients if, it, if there's an ingredient area. Yeah. Well, here you go. So it's got a protein blend, uh, pea protein, hemp seed protein, and goji berry. Is that it? All right, uh, let's let's double check on that because if that's it, that's not bad at all. That's awesome though. I mean, that's what you're looking for. You're trying to find these. If you're gonna, if you feel like you can't break free of your whey protein, <laughs> and you you need it in your diet, there. This is what Here's you're looking for. Your first you're, step, you're, yeah, right. In you're the right looking, direction. You're looking for a a, a blend. Let's see what. What does it? that say? Does it say organic stevia? Oh no, it says sea salt. Other ingredients. Oh yeah, yeah. They do have some other ingredients down at the bottom. Let's yeah. 
blow the, that up. Thank you. It's got uh, organic vanilla flavor. I don't like that it has a proprietary blend. Organic. Well, mm. so you know, okay, so here's why they're going to do that with vegan proteins. Because vegan sources of protein are sometimes limited uh, in certain amino acids. So you'll get more complete protein. This is why vegans are always encouraged to combine like rice and beans and proteins together. Because your body will utilize however much protein it can, but then if it's limited by a low one amino acid being low, one essential or whatever, then it's actually not very bioavailable. So mm. it's going to be very rare to find a vegan protein that's not a blend. Okay. Although hemp, it's good enough. Uh, pea and soy are actually pretty good on their own. Look, they do. Um, okay, so there you go. Stev- now, they have a stevia, yeah, stevia e- extract. Sweetener, yeah. yeah. So this has vanilla flavor blend, guar gum, which gives it that 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 texture, sea salt, and stevia. So is stevia a good uh, substitute for artificial flavor. It's a better choice. It's a better choice. Is it ideal? No. No. Again, you are talking about something that is giving you that sweet signal to your brain that's not delivering carbohydrates or sugars and could change uh, how your brain perceives certain foods. Also, stevia, not entirely sold on how it affects the microbiome. Pro- I would, I'm would. i going to bet it's a lot better than artificial sweeteners, but having even that on an every single day basis, probably not the best idea. So this is actually a protein that I've had in the past that every once in a while, and when I say every once in a while, probably at the most once a month, more like once every other month where I'll throw it in a smoothie or something like that. And that's Warrior Blend by um, Sun Warrior. Mm-hmm. So I guess at the end of the day, here's the advice. Um, whole foods, nothing comes close to whole foods in terms of health, mm-hmm. muscle building, fat loss, the way your brain is going to perceive, the way you taste certain things, digestion, like everything across the board, whole foods, superior. You don't need protein powders. You're better off without them. That being said, if you are one of those people that may need protein powder here and there, uh, then go for organic, minimally, you know, minimum amount of ingredients, uh, non-artificially flavored, non-artificially colored type protein powders. Those are the ones we recommend. The two that we just randomly yeah. pulled and up. They may the, be a little more expensive, and it may look like like your serving size is less, right? But that's you know you want to seek more of the quality, right? And because in plus the serving amount that you're going to use is going to be less than like what all your other people are going to recommend. So it's going to last you a decent amount. Of I time. also want to make a point that our bodies don't run on this perfect 24 hour clock, so. Don't look at it just like as a as a one day snapshot. So when I made the point that I actually utilize whey protein shakes every now and then, it's because I've strung like two or three days in a row that I've noticed I've been really low on protein. Because first of all, having some low protein days actually ends up benefiting me. Because mm-hmm. we've talked about that oversaturating our body with too much protein, then it become then it desensitizes it, right? Mm-hmm. So When I have like a day or two of low protein, I don't even sweat it whatsoever. Now, I start pushing three, four, five, a week straight where I'm consistently not hitting my targets. That's where you see me kind of introduce that. Don't look at it just for that one day. If that one day you're low, but yesterday you probably ate over 20 grams of protein, you're fine. You're totally fine because it doesn't work that way. It's like an average. It's like it doesn't work on a 24-hour clock because this day you're low on protein, but yesterday you weren't. Don't look at it like that. Look, Start looking at your nutrition like a snapshot of like a week and pay attention. And if it is something that you're consistently missing, then I could understand putting it in there. But for a single day, you know, one day of low protein actually will probably do more good than it's going to do harm. You're not going to lose pounds of muscle off of your body with even missing your protein targets for an entire week. Yeah. It doesn't work, not and, pounds. And if you really want to drink your calories uh, post-workout and dairy is not a problem, have a glass of non-fat milk. Uh, or ideally have a glass of whole milk. Whole milk. Yeah, whole by milk. the by the way, and I know because and the reason why I said non fat because you got people freaking out about oh, I don't want to have you know extra calories from the fat or whatever. But I'm gonna also tell you this that there's now been some studies that have shown that uh, non fat milk connected to things like diabetes and health issues. Whole milk far healthier for you, and of course don't forget the fat soluble vitamins that are in milk require fat to be uh, utilized. So going the non fat route actually is uh, far worse for you. You're better off with whole, whole milk, or get some like whole fat, you know, Greek yogurt or whole fat cottage cheese, or if you can't have dairy, can of tuna fish. Super fucking easy, and a fruit. Boom. There's your post workout. I wonder right what there. the stats are on 
on non-fat and slim milk over the last three to five years compared to like the 15, 10 to 15. Non-fat milk sales have dropped and whole milk is starting to go up. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I would be curious. I've never given my kids fat free milk. It's so not no, good for always you. Always whole milk. It's yeah. like, it's very, very, it's and not I, healthy. I, I grew up on 2%. And then when I first got into training and lifting, then I went to uh, not a slim, which is one. Right. And then mm. I went to non-fat. So for years as a trainer, it was non-fat, non-fat milk forever. The healthiest part of milk is the fat. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I know. that's the funny part. That's really it is. That's the funny part it of is. the whole it's, thing. It's yeah. crazy. And it tastes fucking amazing anyway. So, yeah. uh, so there you go. There's your advice right there. Uh, if you want to drink something post-workout, grab yourself a glass of whole milk or, or eat a can of tuna fish or something like that. If you absolutely have to take protein powder and you just, it's just something that you have to have yeah. in your nutrition, aim for the organic non-artificially colored, non-artificially flavored uh, varieties of protein. And I hope people understand where we're coming from on this. Like I, I, I feel like we get misunderstood when we get into these like, you know, battles on Instagram with doctors that are out there. No, I think, I think we made our point pretty well. I mean, we're not anti-supplement. I mean, we got to be very clear. We're not anti-supplement. We're pro yeah. supplements used properly. Well, we want to use them for deficiencies. That's it. Supplements have, there, there's definitely a need for supplements. If you have low vitamin D or certain minerals are low, or like Adam was saying, if you're one of those people that, you know, you're just deficient in protein, or, you know, if you're an athlete and you're just, you're trying to squeeze out another half percent performance because you're training at that level, um, or something like creatine, which has lots of benefits, especially for vegans, like then there's, that's where supplements, you know, can, can come into play. But supplements don't replace food. And they probably should not be a staple yeah. part of your every single day life unless you're one of those rare individuals. You're not so, healthy just because you're eating supplements. Yeah. And then there are categories of supplements that are complete waste of fucking time, like pre-workout uh, supplements. You can just throw them away completely. So <laughs> yeah. with that being said, uh, we offer 30 days of coaching for free. Um, and it's still available. It's still for free at mindpumpmedia.com. Just go to the site, opt in. You're going to get tons of free information from us. And it gets updated by us, which means you'll always have it and you'll always get it updated. Um, also, you can find us on Instagram. We answer questions on Instagram all the time. We answer them on air for our Q&A episodes. Uh, the Instagram page is Mind Pump Media, or you can find our individual pages. I'm Mind Pump Sal, Justin's Mind Pump Justin, and Adam is Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>